Well, the biggest piece is uh, 5416D. We've been working on that since the beginning of the year. It first transpired as Senate Bill 1302, which is a bill that I sponsored um, along with my co-sponsor, Americans for Safe Access. Uh, that's, that's monumental. I think 85% of cities and counties currently do not allow uh, any retail sales. So now we've just effectively opened up the entire state, which is going to be insane beneficially to help quell the black market. I mean, as, as everyone knows, the black market is, is completely out of control right now. And with all the, all the taxes, regulatory costs, compliance costs, everything that comes into the barriers of entry to become licensed and permitted, it, it, it's insane. So we, we needed to get that under control. And now also uh, consumers are like, they have, a, they have a safe avenue to buy licensed and tested products. So that was a big win. Yeah, that was that was huge. And then the, the uh, 54, 15.1, which was the tech regulations for uh, ancillary companies. That was, uh, I mean, that was obviously targeted at a few specific entities. Ease. That yeah, ease, of okay. course. So um, that was that was a big win because now that levels the playing field. Uh, very specifically that the transfer of cannabis goods uh, facilitated through an ancillary company is, is no longer allowed unless they have uh, ownership in the company through a percentage, through equity share, through licensing. Um, it, made, it made the process of uh, dealing with these ancillary companies completely transparent and, and onerous. Uh, to, so to so basically in this scenario, like Ease, uh, Ease has a fleet of trucks, correct? Uh, so that's... That, so that's what the, I should say, quote unquote, employees are under the guise of. But technically, they're employees of their partner dispensary. So uh, that that just creates a diluted process for in so many different ways. So let's say I'm, I'm hired on as a driver through ease, but really I'm the employee of a dispensary that I've never stepped foot in. And let's say I'm injured on the job. Who do I come after for workman's comp or compensation or... There's just so many different ways to where that can be convoluted and, and consumers alike as well. So I buy an edible from Ease and I get sick. That completely dilutes the recall process. Who do I contact to say where this product came from to eliminate this from happening to so many other consumers that could have the similar pro problem, right? Or who do I go after financially through a lit litigative matter which uh, statute of limitations under some circumstances is a very finite time to get your filing in. So who do I contact to, to have the attorneys send that to? It just creates a whole slew of problems. That are, are the regulations basically telling the ease of the world you need a delivery license? Right, yeah, exactly. So do you think that ease is now going to get a delivery license? Um, I, I don't see that. I don't see that happening just because um, I think that the sole... The, one of the main, I shouldn't say the sole purpose, one of the main purposes they've been operating in the manner that they have is because they escape the 280 federal tax liability, they escape excise tax, they escape local government, ta uh, local government tax, um, just so many different layers of taxes they escape on top of the compliance and regulatory measures and costs associated with that. I mean, they've already been through multiple rounds of investment, and now to switch gears and tell investors that they're going to have to be liable for these tax responsibilities and these oversights and these federal risks that they now have to mitigate. It's not going to be as easy of an ask as it is to say, "Hey, we're an, we're an amazing tech platform. Invest into us." So I, I don't, I, I, I would think it just myself from being a business owner, it would be the smart move to pull back and become solely a tech provider because that's going to be the easy ask for money from investors and to continue moving forward with that since they have that. But. Um, so, it's so, up, it's so, up in the so air. because they were, be they are becoming a very big player in the space, and I, right. I think their vision was to sort of dominate up and down the coast. Right. So, with them sort of having, seemingly having to retreat a little bit, how do you see the delivery market playing out in 2019 and beyond? Do you, do you eventually see like companies sort of, do, you know, service in the entire state or super hyper local and regional? Um, I think we're going to see a little bit of both. I think this uh, provides a better opportunity for small business to thrive, and we're going to see some bigger players start to emerge and and, 
and gain market share where Ease is having to retreat from. So I, I think it's going to be the, the best of both worlds. And I know that um, a lot of trade associations statewide within every every sector, whether cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and retail, are now coming together and realizing that there's an onslaught of Canadian investment money, a huge investor money coming in, and a uh, threat of big business coming in to consolidate the industry as a whole. So it seems like delivery companies, I mean, you just mentioned two big wins. It seems like you're one of the licensee categories that's actually happy right now as a, as a generality versus like I think of, you know, at, at, from small delivery operations too big, whereas I see like in the cultivation world, if I were a small cultivator and just hammered by regulations, it's almost like only the big can play in the cultivation or certain areas of the industry, but delivery, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, seems like a part of the market where small players can thrive in 2019. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that uh, the Bureau and otherwise recognizes the threat from the black market and what that's doing and, and providing the retail outlet and, and also the equity issues that delivery satisfies because it's the lowest barrier of entry license type. So with equity rolling out on the state level with Senator Bradford's um, equity bill, I think it was 1292 or so. I can't remember these. There's so many bills in my head, but um, with, with the equity issue that delivery satisfies, low barrier of entry, uh, being able to come in and eliminate the black market through services provided now into these ba banned localities, I think that was that was a huge win overall for the industry. But but like you said, the, I mean the white label issue, I'm, I'm sure that you're aware of the IP issue. That was that was huge. That was a big deal. Now everybody's freaking out because of that. I mean there was a uh, uh, discrepancy but 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 your lane which is a delivery company like that doesn't really affect you very much does it no okay. no no delivery is uh, so you're like <laughs> sucks for you manufacturers and brands <laughs> right. yeah. but wh whoever ends up needing delivery i'll be there to do it right yeah so i mean we're, we're we are moving into vertical integration in sacramento uh, we're looking to vertically integrate. Some some of these issues are going to impact Meaning us. Meaning your company. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So some so of these you, issues. So you want to get into what? If you're currently delivery, wh where's the next first step? Uh, in vertical integration. Uh, we're, we're just going for everything at once. So we're converting from delivery to delivery, manufacturing, cultivation, and distribution. And retail or no? Yeah. All, yeah. All okay. elements. So delivery, retail, distribution, cultivation, and manufacturing. So where are you going to get? Where do you? Where's the first retail location going to be? Uh, Sacramento. Okay. So Sacramento yeah. retail, and then right next to that retail facility, you'll have a manufacturing, or somewhere near it, you'll have your manufacturing. Um, it's a huge thirty thousand square foot warehouse, so it meets the needs of all different um, business types. Oh, so you can run everything out of that single thirty thousand square foot location. Yeah, yeah. So it's That's it's thirty thousand right? square feet, but it's um, it's it's segmented off into separate buildings, all isolated for their different license types. So we're uh, moving there. Sacramento is going to be our first vertically integrated facility. We're working on finalizing the land deal in San Joaquin County uh, to move forward as soon as their Measure B rolls out, which is a tax initiative. And then forming a, a strategic partnership in the in the city of Los Angeles currently, uh, to be able to hopefully capitalize on the statewide delivery regulation if it is solidified. So, what would you have going on down in LA? Like you wouldn't you wouldn't have necessarily have manufacturing. I mean, uh, uh, cultivation. Uh, so I believe with that partnership, it's going to be dis distribution, uh, distribution and cultivation. And then when phase three rolls out, supposedly in January delivery would be able to be included in that model. Oh, so LA city, not yeah. county. I was going to yeah. say county. That'd yeah. Be a little, okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, and then to fund all this, I mean, are you raising capital or are you? Strategic partnerships. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, quite, quite honestly, I don't want to, I don't want to do the day to day operations of this anymore. So I've brought in strategic partners for each aspect of it, cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and the delivery retail to do the day to day management aspects of it and also capitalize to, to do the build outs. Well, I was gonna, so d you acquired that 30,000 square foot space. Are you leasing it or acquired it? What's that? The 30,000 square foot space in Sacramento. Did oh, you yeah, I'm leasing that. Yeah, oh, you're so leasing it. Okay, so you yeah. don't have a huge upfront capital investment. But, but no, you're, no. you're, 
uh, we drop is funding the build out of that entire yeah, yeah. So uh, we did close down on July 28th. We let our temporary license run out in Oakland um, because astronomical costs associated with operating the Bay Area, as I'm sure you're aware, just the land costs, uh, employment wages are extremely higher, 16 to $20 an hour there versus 12 to 14 in Sacramento. Land cost was almost $3 a square foot there. It's a buck in Sacramento. Um, taxes are 10% in Oakland. They're 4%, well, effectively 5% with the um, the 1% contributes, so 5% in Sacramento. So it was just so much cheaper to operate. We, we took our capital that had accumulated from operating in Oakland and, and put that into every, into operations in Sacramento. Do you think, speaking of Sacramento, <laughs> do you know that guy? Joe? <laughs> yeah. Joe Devlin, <laughs> come on down, grab well, a seat. <laughs> Let's talk about delivery, Joe. <laughs> Gra gra grab that seat. Um, do, well, first of all, before Joe, uh, before Joe joins us, uh, do you think Oakland is getting the message? Like, what's happening? Because I, it seems like everybody wants to get out. At some point, Oakland's going to be like, holy shit, nobody is doing business here. And yeah, so they're in the process of running a, a tax measure to reduce taxes. Um, so they're, they're aware of the problem. And... Uh, I think that uh, Oakland is a real pioneer. They've been involved with the cannabis industry since 96 when Prop 215 came about. And they just really tried to push the envelope and be on the forefront of what was happening here. And like everybody that did that, there's things that they're going to have to correct. Uh, the, there's a ton of applications in. Um, the, the market's going to dictate itself. They're going to see a lot of businesses collapse until it levels off. Uh, the taxes were astronomical. Those are going to have to come down. But we're, we're seeing that in a lot of localities. I think San, Santa Cruz. Uh, Santa Cruz is, has a measure to reduce their taxes. Um, and there's a, there's a few other localities that, that are also trying to reduce their taxes too because they started, a lot of them started at 8 to 10 percent. And it's just, it's not sustainable with an effective tax of like 37 overall. It's just, it's just completely unreasonable. So what percentage of the companies that two years ago were operating in Oakland do you think either have already moved out or are desperately trying to get out? Um, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't say, honestly. Gut, in gut. You give, me, give me a, like a lot, a few. <laughs> <laughs> what what companies are trying to get out of no, Oakland? No, like what percentage of like a lot of companies have already left or some have left but um you know I you left yeah I did leave um Sacramento has a lot warmer water so I'm <laughs> trying to <laughs> try, trying to trying to get uh, better situated but I, I I hear all the time of companies getting ready to leave Oakland or leaving Oakland or shutting down so I would I would say that the market is definitely going to level out. I can't put a percentage on it, but just from the people I talk to, I'd say in the range of about 25% is, is getting ready to leave or has already left.